religion is so important to this region, not just Israel, all the countries around Israel. Yes, there are people who observe whatever their faith is. There are those who may not observe, but they all believe in God. How did the U.S. earn the trust of leaders in the Middle East during the era of President Trump? Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map, but they also want to attack the rest of the region, including Israel. President Trump understood this and wanted to protect the region, which was evident in his unique approach. Hi, and welcome to this special episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. And in today's episode, Jason Greenblatt shares how they flipped the script of maintaining peace in the Middle East throughout the old playbooks and used a different approach to achieving progress and a level of peace in the Middle East that had not been seen in decades. Here's today's episode with Joel Rosenberg. My next guest is the person that helped set into motion President Trump getting four yeses, the historic Abraham Accords, after first doing an amazing deal of the century. That's how it got dubbed by President el-Sisi of Egypt. But my guest is one of the top Middle East advisors in the Trump administration. Uh, Jason Greenblatt, welcome to Jerusalem, welcome to TBN. And it's such an honor to see you. Uh, You've become a friend and you really are an an amazing insider in what has happened in the the transformation of this region from just war, terror, genocide, religious persecution to a new era of Arab-Israeli peacemaking. Uh, First of all, welcome to Jerusalem. It's good to see you. you. It's great to be here. I'm honored and And I think back to what John Kerry said and did just before we came into office. Mm -hmm. If you remember, there were the three Khartoum no's, right? Right. No recognition of Israel, no negotiation with Israel, no peace with Israel. He decides to add a fourth no. Coincidentally, (laughs) you're right, President Trump achieved four peace deals. There was such an arrogance about that statement and how wrong he turned out to be. He did. There's so much I want to cover with you. Again, Mm -hmm. there's so much I want to talk to you about, but let's start with there uh, just very briefly. What was the single most important factor in President Trump and your entire team getting to four yeses, uh, historic? Uh, no president had ever seen that happen. We have not seen a, uh, an Arab-Israeli peace deal since 1994 when uh, we saw that deal with Jordan and my friend, our mutual friend, King Abdullah II. But what at the core made, you know, why is this night different from all other nights? Why was 2020 the year that everything changed? I think the core is the unique nature of President Trump. There are people that love him. There are people that I'll say don't love him. (laughs) Um, A different kind of president. He wasn't afraid to break China. I don't mean China the country. I don't want to get into trouble. (laughs) Wasn't afraid to break China. One topic at a time. Right. He wasn't afraid to say, figure it out. Something has to change. Don't be afraid to try new ways. He earned the trust of the region, the entire region. When we came into the region, the people felt betrayed by the prior administration. And he because of the Iran deal, tilting all of, of the U.S. Iran policy deal. towards our worst enemies yep. and, and basically uh, throwing uh, or feeling the feeling that Israel and the Arab world was thrown under the bus in secret negotiations to give $150 billion to our worst enemies. That's right. And you hit the nail on the head. Everyone always speaks about how Israel is threatened by Iran. And of course it is. The, I should say the Iranian regime. Of course it is. Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map. But you know what they want to do next? They want to attack the rest of the region. They want to move into all these beautiful cities built in the Gulf that are being built in the Gulf. Then, of course, they want to attack Iran. Mm -hmm. And President Trump understood that, and the region saw in him somebody who understood them and who wanted to protect them. Uh, When I interviewed uh, my friend, uh, Vice President uh, Mike Pence, uh, at the White House the day of the the amazing Abraham Accords signing, uh, I interviewed him immediately after his lunch with the president, with with Netanyahu and and the other leaders. And he said, we threw out the old playbook. Then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told me for my book, Enemies and Allies, we, uh, we flipped the script. In, in a sense, what you're saying, new thinking, you just threw out the conventional John Kerry way that had been done, which meant that there hadn't been peace for you know, a, a generation, almost 25 years at that point. You guys decided, well, why do it the exact same way? 100%. I'm a fan of both Mikes. They really know the region. <laughs> Uh, they know their stuff. And those are great answers to your first question, which is what's, what's the way we did it? And the way we did it is how they answered it. But we had to 
earn the trust of the leadership. And the way we earned the trust of the leadership was the unique thinking and backing of President Trump. Well, I look forward to getting into that story because it's so important. But let's back up for a moment. Uh, you're an Orthodox Jew. I'm an evangelical from a, you know, I am a Rosenberg. Uh, my dad was born and raised in Brooklyn. His family escaped as Orthodox Jews out of, out of Russia, out of Minsk, back in the pogroms. Uh, so you and I come at the world theologically differently, at least on the, who Jesus is. But in many ways, you and I have come to find that we have such similar viewpoints. And I want to start with you and I just meeting. Uh, why, don't you t- why don't you share that story? But it was right here in Jerusalem when we first literally uh, ran into each other. Yeah, I'll go back before we met. Okay. Because um, I have a lot of great stories from the White House. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your work. Thank you. I was reading a story, one of your books, I can't remember which, and the story, the chapter that I was up to, I remember picking up my daughter from class and saying, honey, you got to listen to this chapter. And you were was, listening on Audible, right? On Audible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was a story about how uh, King Abdullah was hosting a peace conference <laughs> at the Palace in Amman. With the, the third prime, target. That was okay, the, yep. the, the Prime Minister of Israel, President Mahmoud Abbas, right. I won't give away what happens. Very exciting. It work. doesn't go well. <laughs> it doesn't go well. And then a few months later, I find myself here, first one day in Jerusalem and then going to Ramallah. King Abdullah sends his helicopter to bring me to Amman, and I'm meeting him. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, how did it happen that I was this ordinary guy reading this book? Never in a million years would I have imagined uh, being here. And then a few days later, I'm at the King David Hotel, that storied hotel here in Jerusalem. And somebody comes up to me on the patio and says, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. He's a great author. I said, who's that? Joel Rosenberg. Joel Rosenberg, wow. And that's that how crazy. we became friends. It yeah. is crazy. You know, so I, I'm a failed political consultant. Everyone I ever worked for lost. <laughs> uh, even when I was on BB Netanyahu's comeback campaign team 22 years ago, it took him nine years to right. come back and I, I played no, no role. Uh, so I went into fiction writing, and I and but it's interesting to create a scenario, and that's one of the reasons I've enjoyed uh, one of many reasons of meeting you. But yeah, you write a scenario, a, a set of novels about how peace could be negotiated, and who the players are, and and who, what kind of bad guys would come out of the woodwork to try to throw sand in, or actually blow up literally or figuratively a peace negotiation, and then somebody who is a reader of the novels ends up becoming the chief uh, you know, Middle East negotiator for the president of the United States, that's a crazy scenario. And, and, but you know, Pence has become a reader of my novels uh, before becoming VP and Pompeo. And it, and it is interesting um, how fiction can play a role in uh, at least uh, entertaining, well, but also advancing educates. ideas. That educates people. Yeah, it educates people. So you've written a book in the path of Abraham, how Donald Trump made peace in the Middle East and how to stop Joe Biden from unmaking it. Now, this came out in the summer of 2022. I love this book so much that we made it the All Israel News Book Club Pick of the Month. Thank you. And uh, I've interviewed you several times about it. And I want to get into that book. And even as we begin, the title, In the Path of Abraham. The Abrahamic Covenant is why we're here. It's why Israel has a country. Talk about, as we go into the 75th anniversary year of the prophetic rebirth of the state of Israel after more than 2,000 years or about without sovereignty, without even many Jews living here, just your angle, your perspective on Bible prophecy, the rebirth of Israel, and why Abraham plays the central character in your title, but also in your faith. So there's two parts to the title. There's the Abraham and the path, and I'll address okay. both of them. Abraham is the forefather of the three major world religions. We understand that this beautiful city, the land of Israel, is so important to the major three faiths. And I'm a firm believer that we could all live here and honor Israel, even if we have different beliefs about Israel and different beliefs about Jerusalem. And I think the state of Israel has done a remarkable job trying very hard to protect religion's importance in this space, uh, despite what the mainstream media says, despite what some agenda propagandist driven think tankers and others say, most of the time, the city of Jerusalem works. Is there tension? Of course. Unfortunately, there are bad actors and Israel then has There's to take measures. There's tension in DC, New York, Portland, yeah. Chicago. You yeah, know, look at the, the United places, States, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I remember there was one summer, a few summers ago, we were supposed to go to Paris on vacation. And that was the summer of the yellow vests. And we canceled our trip. And I thought to myself, oh, that would never happen in America. Mm. Look what's happened in America. Right, right. Every country has tension. Yeah. I think Israel does a great job. They recognize how important it is to the world's religions. They recognize how important it is to billions of people around the world. And they do a great job. And I come here and I pray at the Western Wall. 
and I see all sorts of people walking around. I go to the malls, I see Jews, Muslims, Christians, everybody walking around. It's an amazing city, and Abraham started it all. The second aspect to the title, though, is the word path. People, you know, sometimes say, oh, the Abraham Accords failed. They pick out a couple of scenes at the World Cup, for example, in Doha, where there was some tension between Israeli journalists and some right. Arabs or whoever they were walking around. What they don't understand is we are on a path. Yeah. Yes, President Trump achieved historical things together with the courageous leaders who signed the Abraham Accords and Prime Minister Netanyahu. I could say that because he's now Prime sure. Minister again. Yeah. But it's a long, complicated path, and it's mm -hmm. going to hit stumbling blocks. But it's incumbent on all of us to keep encouraging it and keep walking all these countries down that path and maybe one day walking the Palestinians down that path yeah, with that, Israel as well. That'd be great. I, I love the book and I, and I highly commend the book to you because it really does take people behind the curtain. Uh, you get to see both the Wizard and the City of Oz and all the cities in the region and you, and you sort of take people in. It's not dishy. It's not a political book. It really is a book about a, a person of faith going into this region and listening and talking and seeing what was possible and then being part of making history. Let's stay on this topic though of the 75th anniversary of Israel. I mean, just talk about your view of prophecy. Most evangelicals don't get a chance to sit down with an Orthodox Jew who's helped make history and worked with a game-changing president of the United States to change the face of Arab-Israeli thinking. But for you, it starts with scripture, it starts in the Torah, it starts with the prophets. I'm, I'm just curious, and I want our audience to hear your view of, of the rebirth of this country after so long of, uh, of exile. Well, I was blessed to be able to be in this role, and to me, watching the state of Israel, I mean, I was only born in 67, but obviously Israel as started years before that. <laughs> a, um, a, a pretty important year, as it turns yes, out. Yes, indeed. So. To watch Israel against all odds, you know, being attacked from the moment even before its existence, terror attacks, war, etc., to become this thriving democracy, a tech hub of the world, a powerful nation, a nation that does good all around the world, a nation that's now recognized by the region as being an important partner. Some recognize it out loud, like the Abraham Accords countries. Others, who I like to call not yet Abraham Accords signing countries, recognize it, do business with them quietly where needed. It's really quite an amazing thing to watch. And uh, there's no question that God had an important role in this. Without God, none of this would have happened. And what people fail to miss is religion is so important to this region, not just Israel, all the countries around Israel. Yes, there are people who observe whatever their faith is. There are those who may not observe, but they all believe in God. What was your exposure to the evangelical community prior to joining the Trump administration? I, you know, building the friendship with David Friedman, for example, I met him when he, I think he had his first meeting with evangelical leaders in Washington at the Mayflower Hotel uh, back in 16, or maybe it was early 17, probably. Uh, he'd been appointed, he had not yet been confirmed. But as we've gotten to know each other over these last five years or so, uh, almost six years now, one of the things he said to me is, I really didn't have any exposure or connection or relationships in the evangelical world. Uh, he's an Orthodox Jew. He was in the business world in Manhattan. It just wasn't part of his experience. I don't know, maybe it was for you. What was your connection to the evangelicals? And what's been your perception now of this world over your, your political uh, or diplomatic life? Uh, embarrassingly, I also had no connection. Uh, really? I, I'd read okay. about them, but I had <laughs> zero connection. My first real interaction was during the campaign. I was honored to speak at Kufi. Okay. Uh, I went to Christians United for Israel. Yes, yeah. uh, Pastor Hagee, amazing, amazing leader. I spoke at a luncheon, and even before I spoke, what impressed me is there was my kids at the time. My oldest kids were about. And you have a lot of them. I have six, six plus kids, two yeah. sons-in-law, so yeah, let's great. say eight. That's nice. There was a, a high school student who was probably around the age of my triplets at the time, junior, senior in high school. He spoke before me for about 10, 15 minutes, took my breath away. Mm -hmm. I thought, I educate my kids as proud Jews, as proud Zionists, proud Americans. The way this young man spoke, I just couldn't believe how passionate he was mm -hmm. about Israel. Wow. And of course, all the leaders did. It was a great lunch, great speakers. Mm -hmm. They were essential to supporting Israel throughout our presidency, throughout President Trump's presidency. They understand Israel's importance. They obviously believe it from a place of religion. Right. I can say only the best things about the community and how important they are both to the American society but also to Israel. Ron Dermer, who was uh, uh, Israel's ambassador for almost seven years, I believe, uh, has been a dear friend for maybe 22 years now, and of course is maybe Prime Minister Netanyahu's most trusted uh, foreign policy advisor. 
he has come under some criticism because he has said in the United States that while the Jewish community is important, of course, to support for Israel, it's really the 60 million evangelicals that is the backbone of that support politically, just in terms of sheer numbers, and that uh, Israel needs to do more to strengthen the relationship with evangelicals. Now, Dermer's been a criticized, attacked really by people who say that he's sort of undermining or let's say, or, or devaluing, let's say, the American Jewish community. I didn't hear that in what he was saying. I heard him saying, no, just I'm just talking sheer numbers. The evangelicals are 60 million and we're not um, in, in the United States. But I'm just curious, how did you see those remarks and what should Israel be doing with the evangelical community? Ron's a dear friend, a super talented guy. I remember the remarks, I remember the criticism. I think the criticism was uh, ridiculous. He's stating fact, the evangelical community is critical to the state of Israel. They play a hugely important role. I think his remarks were exactly on target and they weren't meant to diminish the Jewish community's right, role. No, the Jewish right. community's role is also critical. Yeah, um, but I think his remarks made some among the Jewish community uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Perhaps like me, and I guess you say David, they don't know the evangelical community yet, yeah. they should. Uh, perhaps others who are anti-religion generally, so maybe those people are uncomfortable with their Jewishness, anti-evangelical because they're uncomfortable with the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. You know, people use things for political reasons. Ron's yeah. comment wasn't political, it was simply factual. It was analytical, yeah. And clearly, Netanyahu has been a pioneer in building relationships with the evangelical community. He really sees evangelicals as a strategic relationship, not just a tactical one. And it's something that I've tried to encourage my fairly new friends, Yair Lapid, Benny Gans, and others. Listen, this isn't a monopoly of Netanyahu, but he is a pioneer and he's 30 years ahead of you. But you should be building it, uh, out these relationships. And they've started to move uh, layout, layout, uh, slowly, slowly. But I think it's something that uh, more Israeli uh, leaders need to be engaged in. All right, I want to talk about business. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get into more of the details of the deal of the century and, and how your role as a negotiator set into motion what became the Abraham Accords. But in a moment, I want to talk to you about the extraordinary business and investment opportunities, because that's not a topic that we have talked yet about on the Rosenberg Report. But when you left the, uh, the Trump administration, you went back into the world of business, but not just as a lawyer, you really went into the world of private equity and, and venture capital, seeing opportunities in this region for Americans and others to invest in that just have never existed before. So when we get back, let's talk about that. Today's verse of the day is found in Philippians 4, 8 in the New International Version. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Our prayer requests today are that we would pray that those who are working for peace in Jerusalem, Israel, and the greater Middle East will be blessed. And second, pray that the historic changes taking place in the region right now will bring greater opportunities for the gospel. Welcome back. We're here in beautiful Jerusalem, a gorgeous day, uh, given that uh, we are in winter uh, here in Israel, but it, it wouldn't look like it today. It's a little chilly, but I'm here with Jason Greenblatt, uh, one of the top uh, negotiators, the top negotiator uh, when during your tenure uh, for President Trump on the Middle East, crisscrossing this region, going to countries maybe I, I would guess that you never imagined uh, going into, being feted at the highest possible levels. And that gave you a perspective that attitudes in the Arab world towards Israel have changed dramatically. First, talk about what you were picking up on this, on the listening tour that you were doing, if I, if I can use that term. And then the doors that have opened now for investing in Abraham Accords countries and, and in Saudi Arabia. We'll, we'll kind of go country by country in a moment. But, but first, what were you hearing? What were you seeing as America's top diplomat on this negotiations, uh, on this pathway, that you reported back to the president that seemed different to you than any other time in, uh, in this region's history? Well, it was really going back to the John Kerry quote, completely the opposite of what he said. Yes, it's true, maybe at the first meeting or so, some of these leaders in the region were saying, Israel, 
You know, <laughs> they whispered it. They didn't say Zionist regime or any of the nonsense that used to be used Zionist decades entity. ago. They Zionist entity. Zionist entity. They, want, they, hate um, us. they were honest about Israel. They understood Israel's importance. They understood they're all sort of in the same boat, all trying to make a positive impact on the world, all trying to bring their societies to a completely new place, understanding where oil has its role and where oil may not have its role in the future. And we were picking up on these green shoots of a desire to have a relationship with Israel. How far it would go, we didn't know. In fact, by the time I left the White House, we weren't sure if there would ever be something like the Abraham Accords. But there was a dramatic shift in the region in terms of the attitude to Israel, in terms of supporting the Palestinian people, frustration with the Palestinian leadership, but at the same time recognizing that the Palestinian leadership should not have a veto right over peace and prosperity in the region. It took a long time, and some of the early wins that we saw, we thought were amazing, and in retrospect, they seem small. You know, Israeli athletes participating in the region, right. the Israeli national anthem being sung in the region at right. sporting events, right. an economic conference led by Jared Kushner in the region right. to help the Palestinians, in getting Bahrain, right. in Bahrain, getting Israeli journalists to that conference. Right. Each of those was, you know, wow. And now, yeah, right. now you have Israelis all over the place over there. It's really quite remarkable. It is remarkable. So um, I remember interviewing you for All Israel News at one point in the last couple of years, and I used that interview in my book, Enemies and Allies. We talked about the coming gold rush, that now that you've got these four Abraham Accords uh, deals uh, between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. By the way, we should also mention with another Muslim country, Kosovo, which is an Arab, but it was mm -hmm. Muslim, and is Muslim, and Israel has a deal with them as well. That's five deals. But that is, you know, if, if you think of the model of Egypt and Jordan making peace, that didn't involve investing. It didn't involve tourism. It didn't involve technology and trade. But this does. So now from your vantage point, both uh, as a diplomat, but also in the world of private equity and venture capital, what are you seeing that Christian investors, Christian business people, and, and all people, uh, Americans who are investors, what should they know that you know and that you're seeing? Well, let me address Jordan and Egypt for a second. Okay. It's a mistake. It's very unfortunate that they have not made their ties to Israel the way uh, these new peace agreement uh, countries have made ties. Different reasons. Uh, and I think Egypt has stronger ties. Mm -hmm. But I've been a big believer in tourism in the region for a long time. My wife and I went to Jordan after the Israel-Jordan peace treaty. Uh, we've been there at least twice on tourism. I've taken my kids to both countries. And I hope that, you know, moves forward a little bit. Yeah. But these other countries, and what investors should understand is, these countries have visions. Saudi Arabia is one, not an Abraham Accords signing country not yet. yet. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, they Inshallah. Have this, Inshallah. <laughs> they have this vision 2030 that I heard about from the Crown Prince, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman in 2017 and throughout my time at the White House. And the first couple of times he was explaining it, it you know, I was like, really? <laughs> really? Wow. But I've been to the kingdom so many times yeah. since 2017. You were just there. I was just there. I'm going back again twice in January. Okay. The progress, society-wise, women driving, women playing roles in government, but the building that's going on, it's really remarkable. People ought to pay attention there. Are the projects hugely ambitious? Do they sound fantastical? Yes, but they're moving forward with it, and people should explore it. And it's not just Saudi Arabia. You know, each of these countries has their own vision. Abu Dhabi is now, part of the UAE is now, has this major ad campaign on CNN called Thrive, enticing people to move there, live there. These countries are beautiful. They're safe. They're in, a, in an upward swing, like I could say about not so many countries around the world. Mm -hmm. They're open. They're tolerant. Do they have a long way to go, some of them? Yes, no question. Mm -hmm. But I'm excited about it. People should go there, explore it, do your due diligence, make sure you get, like anywhere, the right partners. Right. There's tremendous opportunity there. It's really amazing. Now, in terms of uh, Israeli trade and uh, with these Arab countries, it, clearly it's going up country by country. It's really been fascinating to watch these numbers uh, grow. Most of the tourism, ha however, has been Israel to the Gulf countries. We haven't really seen yet Emiratis, Bahrainis, Moroccans coming here quite as much. Part of that was COVID at the beginning, but I don't know. It, maybe it's still, it's, it's just a process of, of warming to this. But the planes are packed between Israel and each of these countries. I mean, I've been to each of these countries multiple times before and now since the Abraham Accords. Things, and you can barely, there's, you know, there aren't extra seats on the planes. But in terms of investment, I, I want to get your sense of it. It feels like Israeli companies are sort of hoping for, and understandably so, Gulf money to come here. 
are we seeing Israeli and American investment going inbound into the UAE, Bahrain, and of course, Saudi Arabia as they do this dramatic economic change from being primarily based on oil to a highly diversified uh, economy? I think Israelis uh, made the mistake initially of thinking that Gulf money is just going to pour into Israel. The Gulf money is very smart money, and they have lots of places to invest. And yes, they're interested in Israel, but they're interested in Israel just like they're interested in any good investment anywhere around the world. And I think Israelis have figured that out. You know, first they went there in droves thinking the money's just on the street to be picked up. Um, it's not true. The Emiratis <laughs> need to learn who you are, trust you, figure out which the right investment is. There's which a lot of coffee and baklava that has to be a had lot of, ahead of it's, time. It's a very different <laughs> culture, right? They're similar in so many ways, mm -hmm. but Israelis um, are very quick. Uh, Emiratis and the rest of the society there generally really want to understand who you are. They want to learn you. They have to trust you. Mm -hmm. They have to know who they're dealing with. And I think they've sort of learned each other and slowly but surely deals are happening, which is a good thing. That's the way, it's a natural way yeah. to do business. Israeli money into the region is slowly happening. I think much more should happen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping it becomes a two-way street because that's the only way yeah. things will really succeed. American money, slowly. There's no question the region wants mm -hmm. American, Israeli, and other money to flow in, and they have the projects for that money to flow in. Um, people should stop looking at the Gulf, in my opinion, as an ATM. Yes, there's <laughs> crazy amounts of money, but if you only look at the Gulf as an ATM, you're not likely to do a lot of business. Mm -hmm. You really need to look at it as a two-way street, and everybody wins. That's great. Okay, we're gonna do a lightning round on a few different questions. First, it is astonishing to me that the two men who were critical elements in, in, in bringing the Abraham Accords about, President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu, were almost immediately voted out of office. Now, those were for different reasons, uh, but it was uh, astonishing, really. Like, you know, they didn't win the Nobel Peace Prize. Apparently, making peace <laughs> for the first time in a generation with four Arab countries, five Muslim countries, that doesn't qualify anymore Not good uh, for those in, uh, you know, in, uh, in Europe. But now you have a situation where Netanyahu is back. And Netanyahu is saying that one of his top priorities is making peace with Saudi Arabia. Do you think that's possible? You and I are, are some of the few people in the world, much less Jewish people, that have ever actually sat for hours with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He's a fascinating person. Tell me a little bit about him. And do you? And Netanyahu, we believe, has met with him also. We were. Uh, I reported it in Enemies and Allies that he, Netanyahu, and. Um, and Mike Pompeo, as Secretary of State, sat down with MBS in Northwest Saudi Arabia, what is the new Neom region, in December of 2020. Do you think Netanyahu can make this deal? Do you think the Saudis are ready for that deal? Talk about the possibility of what I think would be the most historic peace agreement in this history's region ever. So first of all, President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu does not get the credit he deserves for starting us on the path to Abraham. He thought about this a long time ago. He raised it with us. You know, at first we were a bit skeptical. He actually raised it. In, in his book, he says he was trying to push uh, Trump to almost skip the Palestinians and go right to uh, the Gulf countries. He thought a deal was ripe. Right, and he, it's an accurate story. He, he, he wasn't trying to just push the Palestinians out, but he was skeptical, it turned out, rightly so, about potential peace between Israel and the Palestinians. It wasn't, I think if we would have skipped over it, it would have been a mistake, and I'm not sure we would have reached the mm -hmm. Abraham Accords, but there's no question he set into motion the concept, mm -hmm. and uh, we were very fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. I think Israel's lucky because he will be a good steward, if not to reach an Abraham Accords with some of the other countries, perhaps Saudi Arabia, to begin to strengthen those ties. But none of it will happen without, of course, the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Mm -hmm. I like to look at it a little bit differently. I'm often asked, will mm -hmm. Saudi be the next country to do it? And I okay. say, let's, let's leave the Abraham Accords on the side for a moment. Let's okay. discuss what Saudi has done. So when President Trump released the Peace to Prosperity Plan right. between Israel and the Palestinians, which ultimately failed, Saudi issued a phenomenal statement. They didn't go back to the decades old talking points right. that the Palestinians and Europeans and others use. They were positive comments. When the Abraham Accords were signed, Saudi opened up air corridors between Israel and Bahrain and Israel and the UAE. This past summer, July 2022, uh, they opened up all the airspace to all countries, including Israel, right, right? right? Step by step, they're making these important steps. And I think we need to, first of all, recognize that 
be grateful for what they're doing, and give them the time and space they need to move in that direction. I think they're heading in that direction. Anything can change. The Abraham Accords happen suddenly, even though it's years in the making, but it just takes something to let that last puzzle piece click into place. I'm bullish about it. I'm not bullish necessarily that they're going to sign something. The world has become a crazier place since mm -hmm. President Trump left office. That's not an anti-Biden comment. That's just the nature of what's happened. Um, but I think they're heading. Though, up. though, I will say you 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 say it right. You know, <laughs> you may not be wanting to be critical of Biden on this show, but you are on the cover of your book. Biden has been so disrespectful to the Saudis, particularly to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Now, Biden thinks he has his reasons, but to call an entire American ally a pariah state and essentially start pulling uh, anti-missile uh, defenses out of the country and, and start to you know, slow down weapon sales and, to an ally, right, while you're trying to make a deal with the enemy, mm -hmm. Iran, uh, has rattled uh, the Saudis. Now, there are reasons uh, that the Khashoggi murder was horrible. I've talked directly with MBS about this, and I've written about it, and it's it was a heinous crime, but he's conceded it's a heinous crime, and he threw everybody in jail that was involved. But my conversations with senior Saudi officials over the last few years since Biden took office is that they are not happy with Biden, and I'm not, I, I'm wondering if it's going to affect Netanyahu's ability to make peace, because Biden, of course, would in theory be involved, and, and therefore Biden would get a huge win. And I'm not sure they're willing to give him that win. How do you read what Biden is doing with the Saudis and what they should be doing, what he should be doing? So it goes beyond the Khashoggi murder, which as you say, was horrific, it was brutal. MBS took responsibility, it was on his watch. But it was beyond that. As you say, President Biden during the campaign said he would make Saudi Arabia the pariah that it is. He was thoroughly disrespectful to the kingdom, to MBS. I've written extensively on that. Yes, he went in the summer of 2022. He had that famous fist bump with the crown prince. And I thought, actually, that maybe the subtitle in my book was no longer relevant. <laughs> maybe they turned the page. I was deeply hoping they would turn the page. I'll take the hit on the subtitle. <laughs> But it turned out there's still a lot of tension yeah. between President Biden and the kingdom and President Biden and the region. Lip service only when the region gets attacked by the Houthi terrorists. We don't even call them terrorists. We should. Right. You know, they took away that Houthi designation as a terrorist state, right. as a terrorist right. uh, group Entity, within yeah. Yemen. They're just not standing by our friends and allies, including the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And you're right. That is going to make it difficult. But let's go back to Prime Minister Netanyahu. His relationship with President Biden is strong. Yeah. If there's anyone that could try to bring President Biden around and see what progress can be made between the kingdom and Israel, I feel confident that he might be the right guy to do it. But until America respects the region and the kingdom and the UAE and others, mm -hmm. and until they stand by it, I think we- And, and stand stronger against Iran, I think, is the other element here. Let's think about that. Yes, for the moment, the deal is over. I mean, President Biden, there was this tape running around the other day where he was saying to a journalist, it's over, but I can't say it out loud, which he kind of did say out loud, but right. you know, like there's no clarity. Is it over until tomorrow when you decide to try it again? Right. You have the protests And it's in not Iran. over because Biden thinks the deal that he offered was horrible, which mm -hmm. it is. Right. It's over because the Iranians are like, why would we deal with you? Exactly. What, what, you're too weak for us to even have a conversation with anymore. There's too much uncertainty going on. I don't think anybody trusts the Biden administration when, when it comes to the Iranian regime. So there's little upside to the Saudis to come to the table under a Biden administration. But you think kind of, Netanyahu might be able to move the ball forward. I think he could thread that needle. I think he could talk sense to everybody and maybe there'll be a, a new approach, but the Biden administration has to become much more clear. They have to emphatically say, it is over and here's why. And the only way we would ever do a deal with the Iranian regime is X, Y, Z, but real clear things that make sense, not things that kick the can down the road and then all of a sudden Iran has nuclear weapons in three, four, 10 years from now. That solves nothing for anybody. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the Saudis will be cautious. I think Bibi Netanyahu was the right guy to do it. I hope he and MBS meet. I won't comment on whether or not there was a prior meeting, but I think they would get along. I think they would respect each other. I think they'd understand each other. So I'm hopeful. You negotiated a plan, obviously with Jared Kushner and Avi Berkowitz and Brian Hook and uh, Mike Pompeo and the entire team, but you were the point man on what became known by President El Sisi of Egypt as the deal of the century. And I, I, that wasn't the term of the actual deal, but it, it, was a, it was an interesting observation by El Sisi because he really was thinking that the, the creativity that you guys were putting into the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, the plan, the 170, 80 page plan that you actually put out, the most detailed plan ever with maps, the whole thing. Sisi, and I talked to him about it, really believed that 
this was something unprecedented in the region's history, that there had been lots of discussions about principles, but very little actual, this is exactly how this deal would work. Now, everybody, uh, you know, John Kerry, among others, said this deal will never work. And many people called it dead on arrival. And, and in many ways it was. You just described it a moment ago as, as a failure because the Palestinians didn't accept it. Netanyahu accepted it. The Arab world said positive things about it. So talk about, you know, was it a waste of time? What, what was your perspective on all those years of trying to put together a detailed plan and then the Palestinians basically not even reading it and calling it a betrayal? Yeah. Uh, first of all, David Friedman, also a key player on the Yeah, thing. sorry, was, David yeah, Friedman, no absolutely. Uh, so <laughs> Forgive me, David uh, is a good friend, and I apologize uh, for missing I don't, him. I don't like using the deal of the century moniker. Okay. Why? Because it turned into a pejorative way to refer to the plan. Okay. You know, people called it, the Palestinians called it the slap of the century, right. the steal of the century. Right. It was a realistic, implementable plan. When we read things like the Arab Peace Initiative or any of the other principle-based things, things sound beautiful and wonderful, and they touch your heart, but they say nothing. What we put together was a very specific, detailed plan of how things could be. It was embraced by Bibi Netanyahu, not happily, right? You know, a lot of compromises, like it, yeah. 100%. He got criticized. We got criticized by some segments of Israel society. But it was understandable by everybody. And it was somewhat welcomed by certain Arab countries and mostly not as Europeans. A, as, as a starting point. As a starting let's, point. Let's, let's discuss this. Let's negotiate this. But the Palestinian leadership... Including an economic element, $50 billion of pledged investments from the region, including uh, the Arab world, saying let's create actual jobs. Let's create desalinization plants. Let's mm -hmm. create factories. Let's build a Palestinian economy that can create a, a, a real source of hope and a future. 100%. That was Jared people. Kushner led that role. It was very, very important because our view was you can't have peace if you don't have economic success. Yeah. So let's work on them in tandem. It was rejected by Palestinian leadership. You have to remember there's two Palestinian leaderships. The terrorist thugs, the Iranian puppets in Gaza who subjugate two million Palestinians. Everybody blames Israel and a little bit Egypt for the suffering in Gaza. It's all because of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other Israel militant withdrew, groups. Israel uh, gave them the whole, it should be a paradise right now. It should be a Palestinian paradise and exactly. it's, a, it's a hellhole. And then you have Ramallah and you have the prime minister of uh, the Palestinians who said he expects or he wants the peace plan to be born dead before ever reading a word about it. So they weren't interested in reading it. They weren't interested in peace. They weren't interested in trying to negotiate it. Our view was, if you don't like what's in the plan, sit down, talk, negotiate as hard so as you want. So why did you do it when many people told you the Palestinian leadership is not interested? Maybe the people are, but the leadership is not. Why, why, did, why because, did President Trump pursue it? Because we were hopeful throughout 2017 until President Trump made his courageous historic announcement recognizing Jerusalem as the capital. We were led to believe by the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah that there was a chance. Okay. We took them as uh, sincere people. And I'm not saying they were insincere, yeah. but we felt that it was worth the time. Understanding the conflict, educating ourselves, educating the world about the conflict. So much of what we put in that plan and so much of our public diplomacy about the conflict was taking away the old talking points that in many ways were manipulative, weren't truthful, and saying, here's the situation and here's a solution and let's talk about it. I think it's a historic plan. I hope that one day whoever occupies the Oval Office, it doesn't matter you know, what political party they're from, they should dust it off. I'm sad to say that the current White House removed the plan from the website mm -hmm. of the White House. They should dust it off. They should use it as a starting point. Mm -hmm. We learned so much. Yeah. Clearly the region trusted us, except yeah. Hamas, right. maybe even the Palestinian Authority, though I think that they have good parts to them that you know, should be nurtured. But the region trusted us. I think they trusted the plan, and I think it could be a building block for a potential solution. Well, I loved uh, the plan. I didn't agree with all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I still struggle with the idea of any perception of d dividing Jerusalem. Uh, we can see Abu Dis from, uh, at least you can, from over my shoulder, where uh, the, a Palestinian neighborhood where they actually once built a parliament. That's where they thought their capital was going to be. It's right here. Look and how close it is. Exactly. The, it's sitting the mosque, there right? and it's unused. Mm -hmm. And now um, and they argue for more. So even though I didn't agree with every jot and tittle, let's say, of uh, every, every page, uh, every line, but I want to commend you uh, and your team and obviously uh, President Trump, uh, Vice President Pence, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and the others, because I never believed that the deal was not useful. Uh, it was being described by people who didn't know what was really happening in this region as an exercise in futility. But because I'd sat with 
then Crown Prince, now President of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin Zayed, MBZ, with an evangelical delegation, the first ever that they had ever invited to the UAE. I'd sat with him. Uh, our team, our evangelical leadership had sat with MBZ. And I said to him, look, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem as evangelicals all over the world. There's 600 million evangelicals. We're praying for peace. But we haven't seen another Arab country make peace with Israel in a quarter of a century. So, you know, we just want you to know we love the Palestinians. We want there to be peace. Uh, but we're going to stand with Israel no matter what. It's unconditional love. That's what Jesus commands us, to love our neighbor, love our enemies. So we just want to say um, we're looking for who's going to be the next one. That was, it wasn't boilerplate. We were sitting with a leader of an incredibly important country who, that didn't have peace, and we had this opportunity to say it. But I didn't expect his response. He, uh, MBZ leaned forward and said, Joel, it's going to be me. I'm like, I'm sorry? <laughs> you know, what? And he, 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 over the next two hours, laid out why he had come to the conclusion that it was in the national security and, and, and national interest, economic interest, a social interest of the United Arab Emirates to make peace with Israel. And he was just looking for the right moment. So when we were, un unfortunately, I would say, we were under a uh, off-the-record construct. We, mm -hmm. we, were, we walked out of the palace with the biggest bombshell headline in a generation, and we couldn't say anything. And we didn't. We kept our word. But that's why I thought that your plan was so important. That the president's desire to actually give the Palestinians and Israelis an opportunity with a real plan to sit down over real parameters and real maps. And when the Palestinian leadership rejected that, I wish they hadn't. I wish they'd started a real conversation. But the fact that they did, I knew that it the plan was serving an incredibly useful purpose because it was, in my view, and I want to leave you with this uh, final question, but I'm going to tell you what I think first. <laughs> and that is, I believe that because you guys put so much real faith effort into making a plan that could work and that could serve as a basis of, of, of a longer conversation, the fact that the Palestinian leadership, Abu Mazen, rejected it without even reading it told the leadership of the rest of the Arab world that, that we can't wait any longer. We want the Palestinians to have a wonderful future and hope, but we're not going to let them have a veto anymore. We have national interests, and if they won't even take a serious plan seriously, we're going to start to move on. Not that we don't care. We do care, but we just can't let Ramallah have a veto over everything. That's my perception. I'm curious, though, because you spent a lot of time, and then you left just before the Abraham Accords were, were wrapped up. How do you read all that effort and how, it's, how it played into the years that have followed? No, it's exactly right, and it, it was part of the path to get there. First of all, I can't say enough great things about Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, Sheikh Abdullah, the foreign minister, yes. Yusuf al Ataiba, my friend, the ambassador. None of this would have happened without really that. Really game-changing leaders, historic, Absolutely. courageous. And the same way you were sitting on that, imagine I'm sitting on that for <laughs> yeah. three years. And again, you never know, but the path that we laid out turned out to be the correct path. I don't think they could have done it without everything happening the way it did. Clearly, they and we wanted a solution with the Palestinians between the Palestinians and Israel. It was not to be, sadly, tragically. But they all recognized, you know, Sheikh um, Mohammed bin Zayed and others recognized that this is essential for the national security of the entire region. Mm -hmm. And they were courageous enough to jump on it. Mm -hmm. And you can see the strength of it. You know, people are saying, oh, with the new Israeli government, what's going to happen? Everything's going to fall apart. On the contrary. They're leaning they, in. They're leaning in. Um, Meeting with are, some of the most controversial yeah, figures that are emerging people are saying, oh, Ben Veer and Smutrich, and it's all going to fall apart. You had national days of the UAE and Bahrain here in Israel, and those guys were invited. Right. I believe they may have attended. I'm not yes. sure. It's the complete opposite of what you read in the mainstream papers. Is it manip manipulative? I don't know. Is it that there's a lack of understanding? I don't know. But you know who understands it? The UAE understands it. Israel understands it. Saudi Arabia understands it. Qatar. Everybody understands how this region works here. It's back home that some people don't understand it. Don't believe what you read in some of the mainstream papers because no, they don't the, get it. I have to ask you about the spike in anti-Semitism in the United States. It's very concerning to me. I've been writing a lot about it. We've talked a lot about it on the Rosenberg Report. But I also have to ask you about a comment that you made about your former boss and the president of the United States. President Trump really disappointed me by 
inviting Kanye West, uh, now called Ye, uh, to Mar-a-Lago. I've had dinner with uh, 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 the former president at Mar-a-Lago. It's a beautiful place. And he is not an anti-Semite. He's the most pro-Jewish, uh, pro-Israel person, uh, one of the most I've ever, I've ever met and has done more for the Jewish community and Israel than I think any president in history. I don't think that's even of a, a question. But his judgment of inviting Kanye West, not several years ago when Kanye wasn't making these anti-Semitic remarks, but after all that, and then welcoming in, okay, maybe Trump didn't know who Nick Fuentes is, but after he knew, why hasn't he apologized about this? Why didn't he, and you have spoken out about that, David Friedman, uh, Mike Pence, others have. It troubles me because it, it, it's, it, this isn't Trump. It's not the Trump you know, but, I, I, but you've spoken out about it. Would you just take a moment and share how you see this? Because his voice, I think, is super important in this battle against anti-Semitism. So I'll start with anti-Semitism. I'm 55. I've never faced anti-Semitism in America. It's an incredible country. I've been very lucky, but I never would have thought at age 55 that anti-Semitism would rear its ugly head in America. It's a big problem. Um, we all need to fight it. It's another reason why Christians and Jews need yes. to work together to fight this age-old hate. Yes. I'll address the elephant in the room question, which I wrote about on CNN. Yeah. First of all, I'm a fan of President Trump, what he's done for Israel, what he's done for Jews. How long did you work for him? I worked for him for 20 years okay. and then three years at the White House. The attacks against him of being an anti-Semite are totally false. He was nothing but absolutely respectful of me being a Jew, an observant Jew at that. He's not an enabler of anti-Semitism. For years, he was criticized as saying, you know, find people on both sides for Charlottesville. Finally, CNN aired the full quote where he condemned the white supremacists right. and others and then said that. Right. So there's been this sort of manipulative effect, um, uh, political, you know, distortion of who he is. That said... Given this, especially this his daughter converted to Judaism, right. uh, married uh, Jared Kushner, who uh, is, a, is a devout Orthodox Jew and who the president adores and mm -hmm. put in, in one of the highest positions in the White House. And the president has Jewish grandchildren. It is really quite... Right. Uh, it's a terrible uh, attack on him. But... Right. So with all that being said, with the respect that we all ought to give him for what he's done for Israel and for the Jewish community and for fighting anti-Semitism, it was a mistake to have the dinner. I think it was a mistake not to apologize, not, not even apologize, but acknowledge mm. that it was a mistake. And it got a little bit worse because as Kanye or Ye, as he likes to be called, began to say even more hateful things, right. including that Jews should forgive Hitler. Oh, and that um, he loves Hitler. Right. That, that, that Kanye West says he loves Hitler and admires him. He this had ample insane. opportunity to do it. He just spoke um, maybe mid-December for a Jewish organization at Trump to Rall. He condemned anti-Semitism in his remarks. I wasn't there, but that's what I read. But he didn't take the next step and say, I shouldn't have had those guys there and they're terrible anti-Semites and I condemn them. Yeah. So it's a missed opportunity. I think it's a mistake. The President Trump that I know is different. I can't explain it. I still have great respect for him. I still know he's a friend to Jews. I still know he fights anti-Semitism. But I think that he has time and should condemn those guys. Yeah. I don't understand it, except in the sort of, he seems to have this principle, I don't apologize. And uh, I think in this case, it would have been stronger to say, but this time, I, and again, it's not just apologizing. I don't think he knew who Nick Fuentes was. I didn't know who Nick Fuentes was. I didn't was. either. And again, I've been to Mar-a-Lago, and I, I'm sure we were vetted by the Secret Service and stuff like that, but I, you know, and he knew me because I knew him, but he didn't know my son. There were mm -hmm. other people in the, you know, having dinner there that I don't think he personally knows. So I think that's possible. But once you know, you have to speak out, and right. um, I think it's a, it's going to be a problem for him. And the longer it goes, it becomes a character issue, not a policy issue or an incidental moment. Jason Greenblatt, thank you so much for taking this time to walk through some of these critical issues, the business and investment opportunities coming in this region, the extraordinary work that God let you do. You know, you were chosen for such a time as this. I think of the book of Esther, Esther and Mordecai getting in, in key positions to play a role in protecting the Jewish people. And you really did that. In many ways, God let you play a role in building out an, an Arab-Israeli peace that uh, I think will endure for some time and is a, is a great answer to the prayers of millions of Jews and Christians praying for the peace of this beautiful, historic capital of Israel, uh, the city of Jerusalem. Thank you for the role that you played. I'm sure you've discovered how important the land of Israel is to the three major faiths and how the political landscape and the relationship between Israel and her neighbors in the Middle East have evolved in the last few years. 
This insight from Ambassador Greenblatt and Joel has provided us with a foundation for understanding these things that is unique to the work of the Joshua Fund. And if you found this podcast really valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Do you want us to talk about something else on this podcast? Do you have a question you want Joel to answer? Go to joshuafund.com and click on contact us. Your feedback is incredibly valuable as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on this podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.